And uh, we'll take a look quickly at Isaiah 61, the Lord's commission with regard to his birth or why he was sent into the world. And then we're going to look at the prophecies, and that's one of them that we'll get to a little later. Uh, we'll kind of work our way back to that one, uh, or back also to Isaiah 9, verse 6. Those will be the key prophecies we'll look at this morning. And as we look at the prophecies of Christ's birth, how the Bible predicted details concerning Christ's birth, and I have mentioned this to you before, but to set up this lesson, it would be well to remember how amazing it is that so long a time before the event, the prophets foretold such details, and that they all came to pass exactly as prophesied. It's really, really remarkable. And I remind you of the day my teacher, my professor, James Combs, walked into the classroom. He was a peculiar guy. You know, I wear weird socks, but he wore weird everything. <laughs> he wore these really wild, remember Becky, these wild jackets. And, uh, he, he had a large class. It must have been 200, 300 students in this class. And I guess it was his way of keeping our attention. I don't know. But he, would, he came in in one of those wild coats that, you know, wake you up. And we had a chalkboard in that classroom. Like I said, it was a large classroom, and there was a large chalkboard in this classroom. This chalkboard had to be oh, 20 feet long. I mean, it was long, big, and it was, I don't know, 10 feet tall. It was huge. Anyway, he had to use a ladder sometimes. He'd put a ladder up, go up and do his thing, and then get down, climb, move the ladder, and this kind of thing. All right. Well, he came in one day, didn't say a word to class, which was unusual. And he got up on the ladder on the far left, and he put him one. And they started drawing circles. Counting. You could tell he was counting. So this went on for four or five minutes. We're all looking at each other, thinking, okay. This is, we know the guy's a little, a little strange, but as he finally just fallen off, you know, is he gone? What's going on here? Uh, we knew he was up to something, but, and, he, and we'd try to interrupt him or ask him what's going on. He would, like this because he was counting. So he just kept on and on and on, the whole class period. That yeah, was an hour class. Well, 45, 50 minutes, I think it was, 50-minute class. And he's the whole time. So we're doing homework, right, catching up on our reading. I did, you know, I was a very studious student. So I thought, oh, okay, well, if he wants to draw circles, I'll, I'll work on my projects, you know, and I, I, I went to work. I the student, some students were throwing paper and, you know, they, some of these kids never grew up. But anyway, we got to the end of the class time, and he finally got done uh, maybe about a minute before it was the end of class. And he was satisfied that he got all the circles in, I guess, because he had a big smile on his face. And he walks up to the podium, and he says, Class, that's the odds that even one of those prophecies, and we, but I forgot to tell you, the week before we had gone over the prophecies of Christ's birth. He said, that's, that's the chances, or, or of Christ's life, I'm sorry. It was life of Christ was the name of the class. That's the chances that even one of the prophecies concerning Christ would have come, would have come to pass. And there are, other, there are over 100 class dismissed. That was it. That had an impress on me, obviously. I keep telling the story. I've told it 50,000 times over the course of my ministry. So thank you, Dr. Combs, for that great illustration. But it's true. I mean, the odds that these prophecies we're going to look at would come to pass by chance, just no way. And then when you look at the prophecies and we realize that many of them are things that Jesus could not fulfill himself. There are some he did fulfill on purpose, which is, by the way, important, because that means as far as he's concerned, he was that guy. He was saying, I'm that person. And but there are so many others Again, Im impossible that the Bible isn't inspired. So, Merry Christmas. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and get into this. And the first prophecy, we'll look at the prophecies of the birth of Jesus Christ, taken from the Old Testament. All right. Because none of the prophecies concerning Christ's birth are found in the New, except as they're quoting prophecies from the Old. And that would be because, well, he was born. So, anyway. All right. Here, let's, we're going to begin here. We could, be, <laughs> we could begin in so many places, but we're going to begin here. Genesis 3.15. You might want to open your Bible and follow along as I look at these different prophecies. Genesis 3.15. I've got them on the screen. 
For the Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What this does is it tells us that this promised seed, this promised Savior, would come to deliver us from Satan, to deliver us from the serpent. And that this promised Savior who would come and defeat the serpent not only would come from the woman, but would come from the woman's seed. In other words, in other words what's important about that is it isn't the case merely that Jesus would be born into the world through the womb of a woman, which is already pretty amazing, but that Christ, this conqueror, would be of the woman's seed. That means that it would that this child would be human, would be a man. And so the promised redeemer who would overcome the serpent would be of the woman's seed. We also make a point that this indicates it's not of the man's seed, although, interestingly enough, obviously, the rest of the time in Scripture, the seed is traced through men. It'll be Abraham's seed. It'll be David's seed, this kind of thing. But ultimately, it's the seed of the woman. Now, that prophecy, we'll see how it gets fulfilled in a little bit. And in thy seed, now he's talking to Abraham, he says, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Genesis 22, verse 18. So the Bible tells us that uh, the Christ child would come of the woman's seed. And the Bible tells us that the seed of the woman gets narrowed down now in the human race to the line of Abraham. God chose Abraham, remember? And gave to him the promise that he had given to Eve. Now, we could have started even earlier than that. We did that Wednesday night when we talked about the pre-existence of Christ. But we could have talked about the fact that this whole thing began before the world was. In the foundations, in the beginnings. Where Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So, the eternal one would come into the world to defeat the infernal one through the woman and would come of her seed. And then God narrowed down from all the human race, he narrowed it down to a man named Abraham and said that this woman's seed that I'm tracing through mankind is going to come down through you, through Abraham. All right, and then I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, <laughs> Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Whew. So there's a one that's promised to come who would be a star out of Jacob. So we go from the woman, now to Abraham, and now to Jacob, who is Israel. And it's from him, his seed, that the star would rise, that would be our deliverer. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So now it's come down to from Jesse, who was, as you know, the progenitor of David. So now he keeps narrowing it down here. In Isaiah 11, verse 1, a stem, shall, a stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And then in Jeremiah 23, verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. Now we've got it right down, narrowed it down to David, who was a king of Judah. He will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So whoever fulfills these prophecies we're going to be looking at in a moment must, of course, align with these prophecies. He must line up. He must be connected to David, connected to Jacob, connected to Abraham. And, of course, that goes back to the woman's seed, to which we're all connected there. But he keeps narrowing it down. 
And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. That's 2 Samuel 7, verse 12. It's the prophet Samuel talking to King David. And he tells King David that a child's going to be born from you that will be established in the earth as king in your place. All right? That's not talking about Solomon. Now we get to some really amazing things. Those you might not think are so amazing because, well, anybody who happened to be a descendant in that line could rise up and say, I'm the guy. But now the person descended in that line must be able rightly to claim to have been born in Bethlehem. But thou, <laughs> Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Ah, that goes again back to Wednesday night's message. We talked about the pre-existence of the king, the eternality of the king, and the fact that eternal means no beginning or ending. And so from everlasting, hmm, out of Bethlehem. So it's got to be somebody that was in the line of Abraham, Jacob, to David, and then has to be born in the city of Bethlehem. Micah 5, verse number 2. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel means God with us. And Jesus Christ is indeed God with us. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, 16, Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifests in the flesh. So on and so. Jesus Christ, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh. And so this verse tells us he is God with us and he will be born of a virgin. Wow. So now we go back to that very first verse, Genesis 3.15, and we get clarification. You know, what happens from the from New Testament or from, we call it progressive revelation. It's something of a misnomer, but I understand what we're saying is we get more light as we move forward. God gives us more information about stuff. And so we get more increasing information as we move forward through Scripture. And with that information now, we understand more perfectly what he meant in Genesis 3.15. The woman's seed. See, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel. People get stumbled on this all the time because they'll say, well, wait a minute. Uh, the Bible says that God told Mary to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So, I guess you didn't call his name Emmanuel. Well, when you say you call his name Emmanuel, that doesn't mean you name him Emmanuel. Well, it, yeah, uh, it, it is. Exactly. You still call his name Emmanuel. It didn't say you're going to name him Emmanuel. I know, I understand. We all do it. I do it too. We first read that, we think, oh, she's going to name him Emmanuel. But that's not what it says. She's going to call his name Emmanuel. Jesus, God with us. See? And Jesus is his name, and his name is called God with us. His name is Emmanuel. His name is, well, like you said, it's an adjective there. God with us. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So, uh, you know, I guess if the New Testament writers had been deceivers and they knew this verse, they would have written it differently. There's a very interesting argument on evidence that, that comes up in this whole debate, which is really quite fascinating. People who work in, in you know, jurisprudence, whatever, who are taking testimony, who are trained to listen for lies in testimony. You ought to read about the rules they use and how they, how they sort all that out and how, how amazing the Bible is. If the New Testament writers were liars, 
they would almost have certainly put in there that Mary called him Emmanuel. All right? Oh, yeah. Those guys knew the Bible. They knew that this said, they knew what this said. They would call his name Emmanuel. And if they were liars, somebody would have come along somewhere along the way and worked that in there. Because everybody makes that mistake. Of course, we could also argue they were smart enough not to make that mistake. But the point is, the Bible is so real. I mean, you know, and that's, that comes up a lot in Easter when I bring out all the witnesses to, to Christ's resurrection. Uh, how some people come along and say, well, see, there's conflict in the testimony, but you look more closely at it, and there's, not, there's no conflict at all in the testimony. Uh, there's added information from different witnesses. There's added information from one witness, and there's uh, uh, information left out from another witness, and that's exactly what you expect in authentic witnessing like that. You expect that. You expect one person who saw the event to bring out certain things, Another person who saw the event to bring out other things. That's normal. If everybody said the same thing, then you would say, uh, something wrong here. Well, the same thing, there's a rule of evidence that comes up here as well. So the fact that it says, and shall call his name Emmanuel, suggests, infers, or implies, I should say we infer, uh, but it implies that she's going to name him Emmanuel. Then you come over to the story where it's fulfilled, and, she, and God steps in. By the way, do you know that? God is the one that told Mary, you are to name him Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. All right? So, did God forget about this verse? No, he didn't forget about this verse. <laughs> what we have is some clarity here. And of course, if you read the language carefully and don't make an assumption from it, you can see, yeah, it doesn't say they're going to name him Emmanuel, but rather they're going to Refer to him as Emmanuel. Does that make sense? Anyway, I, I, I got to go. Let's get on to the next thing. <laughs> a virgin shall conceive. He will be born of a virgin. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. That's interesting. Kings of the east. You know, we talk about the wise men in the East who came to him. You wonder where they get the idea that they were kings, right? We often wonder, where did they get the idea that, this, that they were kings? Well, this prophecy is one that's often referred to. I don't know that I would argue uh, with, with a, a dogmatic insistence that this verse actually is a prophecy concerning those wise men that came from the east with the three gifts. We don't know how many wise men there were. There might have been 20. I don't know. There might have been uh, 40. Probably more than one since it says men. Plural. So no doubt more than one. Might have only been two. So if you lose one of your wise men in your crutch, don't be afraid. Don't be concerned. Set them up. It's all right because we don't know how many. So, but we know that they came from the east, and these places are in the east. And so, you know, it's thought, uh, or at least Seba, and so it's thought that, uh, or Tarshish and so on, land of the isles and all that. So, many believe that this is a prophecy concerning the kings. We three kings of Orient are, right? What well, could be. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, Lamentation and bitter weeping, Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Jeremiah 31, 15. So this is a prophecy that was fulfilled when Herod sent the soldiers into, into uh, Bethlehem, the Ramah of Bethlehem, to kill all the babies that were two years old and younger. That's sad. It's one of the saddest stories in the Bible. And uh, Rahel, you know, Rachel was buried there in Bethlehem. How I many you remember that? So Rachel was buried there when she died. And <laughs> would have been really sad if she was buried there alive. But, uh, but after she died, her soul was in departing before she died. 
uh, and Jacob buried her there in Bethlehem. And, uh, and then the Bible tells us that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And then the Bible tells us that these wise men from the east came to Herod. And you know the story. Herod pretended to be interested in where this child was so he could come and worship him also. But if he was telling the truth at the time he said that, he certainly didn't follow through on that at all, but became no doubt fearful of a child growing up in his jurisdiction that had a claim to his throne. You know, so anyway, in unbelief and in wickedness and in evil envy, he sent the soldiers there to kill those babies in Ramah and they, uh, and the, the weeping went up and the wailing went forth and so on. But before that, Jesus had told Joseph to take the child into Egypt. And so they fled to Egypt and, he's, and, J- and God gave Joseph instruction to stay there until I call you. Now this goes into some Interesting stuff because you wonder about a lot of things. You're wondering perhaps like stuff like, uh, you know, hmm, why didn't God just pinch that guy's head off? You know what I mean, right? That's what I would have done. Just, you, oh, yeah. I saw that thought come across your head. You're going to kill all the babies? Right? <laughs> you know, we would do stuff like that. Uh, you and I have a hard time sometimes getting into that level of thought. The Bible says our thoughts are not his thoughts or his thoughts aren't our thoughts. His ways aren't our ways. Uh, the Bible speaks of the inscrutability of uh, the purposes and plans of God. They're hidden with his own counsels. And we really don't, uh, in our way of looking at things, completely understand, but we do the same things. We do this kind of stuff all the time in our own way and for our own reasons. I can give you all kinds of examples. Um, you know, frankly, this, these aren't perfect examples, but they do suggest that there is a way of looking at this that is a little more complex, that there's a lot more to it than just simply, why didn't God go in there and pinch that guy's head off and not let him go kill those babies in Ramah? Right now, there are Christians, I, don't know, I, I, try to, I try to keep track of it, but it gets, gets ahead of me. <clears throat> there are Christian people being murdered today, all over the world. We do nothing. There are reasons we don't do anything about it, right? But it's happening, and we're not doing what we could do to stop it. Let me give you, let me give you some examples to think about this. We could stop it. We could just drop a couple of atom bombs over there. Maybe that would be worse than not doing anything. You know what I'm trying to say? It, my point, the only point I'm trying to get across is don't get high-minded and start accusing God. Hey, why didn't you pitch his head off? In our own world, in our own experiences, there are circumstances that align themselves in such a way that we let things go that we don't like. Now, I, the scale is very different. I get it. And the scale is different on, in every measurement. The scale is different in terms of our power to act. The scale is different in terms of the problems we're trying to deal with. I mean, the scale is different on every single level you can think of. All I'm asking for you to do is to have enough uh, thoughtfulness about you just to stop and pause and consider this. Hmm could be he has good reasons for this stuff could be there are times when we don't act when we would argue well there's this reason and there's that reason see you get what i'm trying to say so maybe god has good reasons what do you think what do you think what do you think maybe god has good reasons you suppose maybe he does maybe maybe if you got into the mind of god you'd go oh Could be. What do you think? So that's where faith comes in, and we trust God because of all the different things he does that that make him worthy of our trust. And we can always go back to him sending his own son to die on the cross of Calvary and look at that for a little while and walk away saying, ah, somebody like that, 
he must have had a good reason for doing this. See what I mean? So without getting bogged down into that any farther, I just want to make it kind of simple and get you, get you thinking about this. And under, we, but I understand those questions come up. I, I have these questions. When I'm reading the Bible and I come across a story like this, I'm thinking, why did Well, you've heard my testimony, right? Uh, how I'm reading the Gospel of Matthew over and over again, okay? And, boy, that's, I like Jesus. He says neat things. He does neat stuff. What power? This guy, man, I'm impressed. And now they're beating him up and he's, done, and he's doing nothing about it. And I'm getting angry. I mean, I'm getting angry about this. I'm getting all emotional. Uh, and I'm a very emotional person in some ways. You know, so I can get pretty worked up. And uh, there were times I took that Bible, I threw it across the room. So this is ridiculous. This is just ridiculous. I'm going to go eat some ice cream. No, I'm, that's literally true. I remember a specific moment. I'm re- at the, at about the 10th or 12th time, I go, this is just, this, this, this is stupid. This is ridiculous. He could just wipe them all out. What? Did, what did, <laughs> so I did. I walked off and got some ice cream. Then I walked back in the bedroom. I sat down. I picked it up again. I went to a red story. So I struggle with that stuff just like anybody else does. I notice this stuff. I think about it. I don't understand why God would let that happen. Why would God let you, you, you identify with the women whose babies are being killed? God's not doing anything about this. Come on. You never thought about that? Of course you have. And you wonder about it. I mean, well, I know I do. I mean, you know, this is the big complaint of the atheist, right? If there's a God, why then does this happen, right? Of course, the truth is we come back to them and say, well, if there's a you, why do you have a neighbor in your neighborhood that's hungry? Right? I guess there's not a you. You must not exist. Because if you really existed, then the person down there uh, on Skid Row wouldn't be there. Because you'd go bring him into your house. And then he's going to say, oh, no, well, I can't do that because, 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 because. You begin to understand? So, well, how do you know that when you talk to God, God doesn't say, well, I didn't do that because, 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 because. Maybe God has his becauses too. Just like we have our becauses. Amen? Only How, how many of you bet that his becauses are better than our becauses? Uh-huh. I think maybe his becauses are probably better than our becauses. But anyway, having addressed that, let's get back to the main point of the lesson this morning. And that is, the wow that God predicted in advance. With Jeremiah, we're talking about, though, 550, 580 years more than that, 600 years before Christ was born. With Isaiah, we're talking about 700 years before Christ was born. When you get into Abraham, you're talking about, what, 1,700 years before Christ was born? See? Or 1,900 years, I'm sorry, before Christ was born. I mean, this is it's just amazing. And these prophecies all came true, literally and perfectly. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now, in the New Testament, this verse is actually referred to as as being fulfilled when God sent Jesus into Egypt, sent Joseph with Jesus and Mary into Egypt, and then called them out. And the Bible says that this prophecy was fulfilled at that time. Wow, it's amazing. And now Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. I emphasized that here a little while back. For unto us a child is born. Now, many of you have had children. Somebody around here had children or you wouldn't be here. Everybody has had either a child or, or has had them. But anyway, so you got, child, you got children. When you had a child, we didn't say, unto us was born. We say, unto Sharon was born. Right? Unto Helen was born. Or unto, you, you, uh, we, we shouldn't leave the husbands out. Unto Lloyd and Sharon was born. Unto Don and Helen, a child was born. Unto Natasha and Bruno, children were born. Unto, right? If I went to the hospital to see your newborn baby and I said, oh, look, unto us a child is born. You might say, huh? 
That's weird. But when Jesus was born, he was born unto us. Not from us, of course, but unto us. From us in this sense of the seed of the woman. Of the seed of the woman, Christ was brought into the world. And so, wow, that's a, from, of mankind in that sense. So it's just a, a very powerful thought. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That word government, um, I think it comes up in the message Mizrah in Hebrew, and it means a principality. It refers to uh, power, authority. It refers to rule. And so the rule, if you will, the principality, whatever, is going to be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Jesus, the child that's born unto us, would be called Wonderful. Well, we can get our head around that in a hurry, can't we? He is Wonderful. We sang about it a little bit here this morning. His name is Wonderful. It is. Amen. He's Wonderful. He's the Counselor. Well, that's the best place to go for any advice you might need. He certainly is the Counselor. He is the Mighty God. Oh, stumble. That is where people trip their, there where people get their toe caught right there, and they almost fall over. That's a tough one for them. The Mighty God. Well, we've seen that expression used over and over and over again for the Almighty God, our Creator. Haven't we? I mean, if you've been through uh, Genesis and you've read through the Bible, you'll know that Abraham referred to him as the mighty God or God Almighty. The Almighty God. Hmm. So this is an expression that is used repeatedly in the Old Testament to identify the Lord Jehovah, the Creator. Let's read this verse again. Now we're talking about the Creator. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. His name shall be called the Mighty God. This helps you with Isaiah um, 7, verse 14, this expression, his name shall be called. All right? Does this mean his name is going to be called Wonderful? And we're going to name him Wonderful. So he walked on the street and said, oh, hi, Wonderful. How are you today? Didn't mean that, did it? It means we're going to look at him and call him wonderful, doesn't it? Isn't that what that means? We're going to call him counselor. He walked, he went around town saying, and somebody said, well, what's your name? He said, counselor. No, of course not. But we're going to look at him and say, there's my counselor. You get it. But this one, these next two are tough. Mighty God and the everlasting Father. Some who can, who pause at the mighty God and stumble and stagger for a little while and yet the light of God's scripture comes in and they can see more clearly that that's exactly who he is. <laughs> Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. That's who he is. Yes. That is such a great question. And I have no idea what they do with this verse. I've got a, a, a book that is written by an unbelieving Jewish man who was Jewish. He believed in God in that way, but in, in the religion of Judaism. But he didn't believe Jesus Christ was, was, was Messiah. And he takes to task all these different verses. He doesn't touch that one. I couldn't find any place in there where he offers an apologetic to explain this verse. And the reason is pretty evident to you because it's obviously talking about a child. I think what they do is they just say, well, he's just identified as uh, the son of this mighty God. All right. I've heard that kind of thing said before, but that guy didn't even bother with it. I've heard other Jews say something like that, but that's not in the verse. That's not what the verse says. It says his name shall be called wonderful. We're going to look at him and say, you're wonderful. We're going to look at him and say, you're my counselor. We're going to look at him and say, mighty God. Who literally did that, by the way? We have a person in the Bible who literally, yeah, Thomas, 
literally got on his knees before Jesus and said, my Lord and my God. So Thomas didn't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. It's clear to me Jesus Christ is God. We get, again, we, we, we're going to talk once again about this, the, the difference between our way of thinking, our level of thinking, our level of intelligence and so on, as opposed to his. So we, we have a hard time getting our head around certain things. How can Jesus be God and be the Son of God at the same time? Right? How can your child be your son, but he wouldn't be you? But he is you, in a sense. I'm going to get off onto this and get myself into some trouble because I don't have the time. I need to really flesh it out. So, But I've dealt with this before in other places. I've talked about this. The truth is, Jesus Christ is God. But that doesn't mean that Jesus Christ is the Father. One way, sort of, again, any analogy I try to offer, there's, the egg has been used, right? You got the shell, you got the white, you got the yolk, but there's one egg. Right? You know what I mean? You've got all these different, you got water. You got water in the liquid form, water in the vapor form, and then water in some other kind of form. I forget what it is. Ice, that's it, thank you. You got water. Ice is water, water is water, and steam is water. But that's all it, right? So we get all these different ways of trying to help our brain get around this, this huge thing. And none of them are perfect because, again, it's, it's a heavenly thing. And Jesus said, if you don't understand earthly things, how are you going to get heavenly things? And so we do the best we can with earthly things to explain some of these spiritual or heavenly things. And here's another way of understanding it, but it's not, a, it's not the best way, but it's, it's a way to help you kind of get your head around it. Uh, you, you, are, you are mankind, and your child is man. You are man and your child is man. Don't confuse the persons, the father and the son, but understand that both are men. You see? So Jesus Christ is God in the same sense that your child is human. But it's more profound than that because Jesus Christ has pre-existence. And we get, right? Just you got to keep the caveats in mind. Or you can't take that too far because it, it's bigger than that, larger than that, and more profound than that. But it, it is, that's, that does contribute to our understanding. Jesus Christ is of that kind called God. That's who he is. And so we worship him as God. So he is God. And then in the second person of the Godhead, manifested in the flesh. Wow. He's the mighty God. Jesus Christ is the, the everlasting Father. Oh, that makes your head hurt. Now what do we do? The everlasting Father. I thought that we said the Father isn't the Son. The Son isn't the Father. We sort all that out. Now you come back and bang me with this thing. Well, you let the light of God's Word filter in here. You know, you are born of Christ. Did you know that? You are born of Christ. You're birthed unto God by the Word. And in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. So we are birthed to God by the Word, the incorruptible Word, which is the incorruptible seed. You following this? So Jesus Christ does stand in relation to us as a Father. I preach a sermon. I really like preaching it because it's just so much fun to watch everybody's eyes go, What? 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 All the way through the message. I love it. <laughs> but it's where I go through all the different ways in which we are related to God. We're children. We're brothers. We're friends. I mean, just everything. He's a grandfather to us. He's a father to us. He even takes a relationship of husband to wife. You can't think of a relationship that we live with in the world that isn't a reflection of some connection we have with God. So Jesus Christ is a father to us. The everlasting father. Well, anyway, 
the Prince of Peace. Ah, good. That's an easy one. (laughs) Finally. (laughs) One we can just go, yeah. Amen. We can take that. But when you get into the morning's message, you'll find out that that's even complicated. We'll we'll find a way to complicate that. Amen. Uh, But but then we'll also sort it all out, and I think you'll find it very interesting. But uh, the whole point here, though, is that unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders, where I want you to focus for the moment, the government, the Nisra, (coughs) all right to rule, will be on his shoulder. (coughs) Now, <clears throat> as I conclude this morning, let's remember how all we've been studying in prophecy ties in to our celebration of Christ's entry into the world. You've heard me say more than once that while we appreciate, I think we get, we are all clear on the reason God sent His Son into the world. And that's clear because God made it clear. For God so loved the world that He gave, or He sent, He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So there, you can't get more clear than that. God sent Jesus to save us. He, t- he said it himself, Luke 19, 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So we know what his mission statement is. We know why he came. We know why God sent Jesus into the world. I say all that, but I also say we generally, however, do not comprehend the full significance of his first coming. We've narrowed down our appreciation for his first coming to that main truth. And that is the main truth. But it is possible to get so narrowly focused on one thing that you don't see the whole picture. The bigger picture is, and the ultimate mission of Christ, is to reconcile unto God all things, everything. Everything, creation, everything is to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ the Lord. And so we see that in Daniel's prophecies. Christ's first coming, the significance of of Christ's first coming is related to all this political upheaval in the world. The, The dominion, you know what that is, you've been taught that, was given to taken from Israel, given to Babylon, and then taken from Babylon, given to Persia, taken from Persia. Alexander comes along, he brings it under Satan, remember, represented by the goat, worshipped as a goat, or in the, in the image of a goat, goat today, which is a hail back to the time when Satan held it all. That's what it's about. And so, it, it, those who worship the goat, the whole idea is, Jesus is not the king, Satan is. Jesus is the usurper, and Satan is the rightful ruler, or Lucifer. That's why Saul Alinsky dedicated his book to Lucifer, who rebelled against the standing authority and earned for himself a kingdom. Well, we understand that at that time in history, Satan had all the kingdoms in, in the world handed to him. Now, he got them from God. God is still sovereign over all. Nobody gets it that God doesn't give it to him. And how did Satan get it? Through corrupting man in sin. So God turned the kingdom over to Satan. But then Satan was expecting Daniel's prophecy to roll on and we would go into the fourth kingdom and Satan would bring up his man of sin. But you want to know what's significant about the day we're celebrating on the 25th? Is that on that day God said, no, not now. Not now. And he sent his son into the world And he pushed Satan's plans off until Jesus is done rescuing as many as he can or as will come to him through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you remember the first kingdom, we talk about the first king. Second kingdom, the prophecy talks about the first king. Third kingdom, the prophecy talks about the first king. The fourth kingdom, it's focused entirely upon the last king. And we have, it's a secret about what's going on at the beginning. The significance of the beginning of the fourth kingdom is that Jesus Christ entered in, stopped Satan from his designs, took all the kingdoms from him, and put them into the hands of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ rose again and said, All power 
is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded uh, you. And lo, I am with you all the way even unto the end of the world. See, the end of the world is when the Antichrist comes up. Jesus is with us all the way, takes us out, and then, well, we leave. Oh. And right now, the spirit of Antichrist is at war with the spirit of Jesus Christ. And this battle goes on, struggling over control of the dominion and, and, and prevailing darkness to keep the gospel light from shining in. Everything these people do, it's about blinding men in darkness so they cannot and will not see light. That's what it's about. So one day, when we finished our mission here, Jesus will take us out. The spirit of Antichrist will rise. Of course, the man of sin will rise in power. And uh, amen. Boom. Then Christ will come and the lion of the tribe of Judah will take over the whole works. Oh, what's with this little guy down here? Oh, here's what happens to him. <laughs> he gets, <laughs> I should have him burn up. I think I'll change that and make him flame out. Okay, but anyway. So, there it is. Conclusion, Jesus is the king and all mankind are his subjects. Praise the Lord. Merry Christmas. Let's stand together, please. Father, we're thankful to you for the wonder of your first coming. Help us not miss the full significance, the full impact, the full meaning of your first entry into this world. We, we definitely don't want to lose that. Well, we want to be so focused on your return. Now, we are to watch for that. But we must not miss what you have for us right now. So help me, Lord God, in the message following when I talk about the promise of the king to make very clear what it is that you have for us right now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.